I used to think that pride was something that primarily children dealt with. I remember one time my sister and I were playing a game of jarts. How many of y'all remember jarts? They were these... Uh, they were these objects that are about this long. They had a steel tip on them uh, with weight on it and kind of a plastic fluted, looked like a little bit of a jet or something. You had two rings that looked like hula hoops. You would spread those apart in the yard and then uh, it was kind of like doing a beanbag toss with the heavy object that was pointed and you threw them uh, toward each other and my sister was beating me badly and I got angry and I took that jart and I threw it at my sister and it hit her right in the chest, like right here. She fell over. And uh, I don't know what all happened, but really it was a result of my pride. It was a scary moment that that anger led to that. And I used to think, well, pride, that's something children deal with. And then I became a teenager. And uh, when I became a teenager, I realized that teenagers struggle with pride too. I did not want to do my, I did not want to do my spelling words because my spelling words, uh, really, they kind of bored me. To be honest, my mom would have us write out thirty words two times. The bottom five words uh, out of the thirty, uh, the bottom five words were a little bit uh, longer words with definitions, and then she would have us write out what those definitions were, and you had to do that uh, five days in a row, well, Monday through Friday. And we had a notebook, spiral notebook, we used just for that. And then at the end of the fifth day, having done all those words, then we would take a spelling test. And then we would move on to the next spelling lesson. Well, I was a pretty good reader and had a really good vocabulary. So I would skip doing the words because at the end of the week, I could ace the spelling. Well, then my mom, after a number of weeks, said, David, I haven't seen your spelling book. Where is it? Well... I had hid it because I knew if she found it, she would discover that I had been passing my, uh, I had been passing my spelling test without doing the spelling words. So I'd hit them. My brother was helping my mom clean the kitchen and found where I had stowed my notebook underneath the stove. He helped move the stove and he found it. And he was chasing me around the table. And he had it, and he was teasing me with it because he knew that I wanted it round and round the table. And it was, it's impossible. It's kind of like chasing somebody around an island, impossible to catch somebody. I was so angry because I knew that if he revealed that, and I couldn't, I couldn't tell my mom what he was up to because then I would reveal myself and get in trouble. So I took my sandal off that I was wearing, and I pitched it at him, and he ducked. And the sandal went through my mom's china hutch. I couldn't tell her why or what was happening. So instead of saying, this was my fault, I started yelling at my brother, it's your fault. You shouldn't have ducked. You should have let the sandal hit you. <laughs> Teenagers deal with pride. Then I became a young adult. And I realize young adults deal with pride as well. This idea that now I'm grown up, I've moved out of the house, I'm in college now, and I don't want anybody to tell me what to do. I don't want anybody to tell me how to spend my money. I don't want anybody to tell me where to go, uh, when I have to be there, how fast I drive, or how slow I should drive. And I realize that young adults deal with pride as well. Then, moving through life a little more, uh, once I hit 40, I realized that uh, middle-aged people deal with pride, too. I noticed when I would go to a car dealership or look at a car, normally the salesman's pitch to somebody who is in their mid-40s is, you deserve this. And so I would think, yeah, I don't need to drive a minivan anymore. I don't need to drive a clunk of wagon. I need to drive something that is a little more representative of where I'm at in life. He's right. I do deserve that. And I realize that middle-aged people deal with pride. Well, I'm past middle age because I'm 50 now, and you don't meet too many 100-year-old men, very few. There's a lady at Metalodge next Sunday. She'll turn 101. 
There are no men, there are no men that met Elijah that are anywhere close to that age. And I realize that older adult men, we deal with pride. Our young adult children come over who have a pride problem, and they talk to their dad, and I'm thinking, what are you talking about? You're in my house, and I can feel that pride coming up. But I realize that senior adults, they deal with pride too. Some years ago, uh, somebody ran into church real quick. They said, Pastor, I'm on the way to town. I'm on the way to an appointment. I don't have time. But there's a lady up on Mulkey Hill. Uh, she's, I know who she is. She's a little bit older. She's almost 90. She's trying to mow her yard, and she is stuck in a shrub trying to mow her yard. She has no business even being out of the house, let alone try to mow her yard. So I ran up there with one of my sons. Who was with me? Brother Ethan was, and we ran up to the top of Mulkey Hill. The lady was there, and she had that mower stuck in the shrub. And I offered to help her. How'd that go, Ethan? She was angry. She was angry. She was mad that we would come and try to help her because she didn't need help. Senior adults deal with pride, too. The point is this. It doesn't matter what age you are. It's something that we're just going to have to deal with all the time, no matter what our age is. I have found that pride manifests itself in many different ways. There are those who have a false humility. I'm so dumb. I'm so stupid. And that is a ploy simply to get people to dote on them and give them attention. And, and all the girls come around in a holy huddle. Oh, you're not ugly. You're, you're, not, you're, you're beautiful. And pride sometimes on the pendulum swings that way with self-deprecation. And then it swings all the way the other way where somebody uh, walks in with swag. That guy that can never pass that front mirror when you first come in and they're like, oh, God, you did a great job when you did this one. <laughs> Proverbs 16, 18, where the scripture says this, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. Help us, Father, to have an openness to hear your word tonight, to understand that no matter what our age is, no matter what our place in life is, that this one sin is something that can cause great destruction in our life. In your name, amen. I don't have the ability to lay it out uh, I've studied some on it, and hopefully one day I can show it. But I believe that pride is a root sin. I really do believe there are so many other sins that emanate from this one sin, the sin of pride. And we've mentioned already that, sin, uh, that the sin of pride is very universal. It doesn't matter if you're a lady or if you're a man. It doesn't matter what your age is. It doesn't matter what your race is or your upbringing. It affects all of us. Pride in the scripture is mentioned by name 46 different times. 47 times in Scripture, the word haughty is used, uh, which has some implications of the same thing, a spirit that is motivated by pride. 15 times the word uh, uh, lofty is used in a sense, it's talking about heirs or heir of superiority that is driven by a spirit of pride. And it becomes a real pitfall in our life. The scripture very clearly says that pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. I want to look at several different ways that this spirit of pride really damages us personally. Just as a reminder, I'm not going to read Probably very few verses tonight that you've not heard before. All we're doing tonight is stringing them together with this common thought that pride is very destructive. It becomes a pitfall in our life. We can fall prey to it very easily. First of all, pride manifests itself or it shows itself in rebellion towards authority. Rebellion towards authority. Uh, there is a lot of 
pride circulating right now in our nation. There's a lot of pride that's manifests in itself where folks say, here's our opportunity, we're going to push our agenda, and it doesn't matter what you think, here it is. And there's pushback to that. I'm not saying, uh, we're not talking about the rightness or the wrongness of anything on either side, just the understanding that when somebody tries to manifest themselves over somebody, generally there's a pushback. And we say, it is American. I've read statements that say, you know, in, uh, back in, uh, you know, 1776, uh, it was a revolution that brought our independence and freedom. And there is a big push right now by some individuals on a grassroots level where they want to have a revolution. Uh, it's kind of a scary thought, to be honest, because uh, revolutions are very costly, and the cost that is paid is very high. A rebellion towards authority. We know what the root of rebellion is. It started with Lucifer. In the book of Isaiah, chapter number 14, verse number 12, how, thou, how art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, light bearer, son of the morning, how thou art cut down to the ground, which did, didst weaken the nations. And that's where we're at. Our nation is being weakened by pride. For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God, I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation on the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds, I will be like the Most High. And that's what the temptation was for Adam and Eve. You want to be like a God? Sure, who doesn't want to be? Well, do this and you'll be like a God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation of the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. That's what the Bible says. Listen to what Psalms 10 and verse number 4 says. The wicked, through the pride of his countenance, will not seek after God. God is not in all his thoughts. Godlessness. Atheism has at its very root pride. That's what humanism has at its very root. Humanism sounds so good, doesn't it? Sounds like humanity. Sounds like something that's good for humankind. But at the root of humanism is we don't need God. Humanism teaches that man is a God unto himself. And that if we give man enough resources and enough time that man will solve his own problems. But the truth is, we have more technology, we have more medical advancement, we have things that we couldn't even dream of 30 years ago, and we are not getting better universally throughout the world. We are not getting better, we're getting worse. Why? Because pride is at the root of it. Rejection of authority, that rebellion towards authority. Whenever you feel that rebellious spirit coming up in your chest, just know that the root of that somewhere in your own heart is pride. Here's something else that pride will do. You know, you are never more like the devil when you are filled with pride. You are never more like the Lord Jesus Christ when you're clothed in humility. And that's a tough statement to accept, but it's a true statement. Number two, pride manifests itself in our life when there is a rejection of accountability. Rejection of accountability. It's so difficult when you go to college because we think at the pinnacle of our life at that point, graduation represents advancement and graduation represents independence. Graduation uh, represents uh, a, a certain spot in uh, puberty where you're no longer a junior high or a teenager, but now you have become an adult. I mean, you're 18 years old for crying out loud. You can vote. You can buy cigarettes. You know, I'm 18. Then you go to college, and they tell you, here's your room assignment. Well, we don't like that. 
Well, maybe we think, let's see who my roommates are. Okay, my roommates are cool. I like my room assignment. But if our roommates aren't cool, we don't like being told what room we're going to be in. My freshman year at college, I was in a room of eight. We were on the third floor in Malone, and it was so hot on the third floor in September. But we had some people in our room that were from down south and some other folks that were from up north. And uh, it was just, we could never strike a balance. So we ended up with dividing the room between the hot-blooded and the cold-blooded, and we kept the windows open on one side and the windows closed on the other side. But we didn't like being told where we were going to dorm. Rejection of accountability. Pride prevents us from saying, I'm wrong. I want us to practice those two words tonight because really, this could be revolutionary in our relationships. Let's say those two words together. Ready? I'm wrong. If you're a pride-filled person, if you have narcissistic tendencies, it's impossible for you to say those two words. I'm wrong. Some individuals... When things go badly, they point the finger at everybody else and they'll never accept responsibility, ever. Pride causes a person to make excuses. I've worked with individuals, you've worked with individuals, that they have excuses for days, but they'll never say, you know what, that was a bad idea. I screwed up. They won't say those words. They think somehow that makes them look bad. You know what makes them look bad is making the excuses instead of saying, boy, that was a fail. And I can't think of how many times uh, when we were working on things at our house or other places that I told my sons, that was a bad idea. Okay, back to the drawing board. We need a better idea because that one was no good. Pride causes people to defend their sin. And that's where we live today. Many years ago when I was a child, for someone to say that they were homosexual at that time, I'm not talking about Christian circles, I'm talking about the world. Christian circles and Christian psychologists even wrote articles in the mainstream newspapers, if you could believe this, that said that homosexuality had to do uh, with some kind of defect in a person's brain. And they said, these individuals are sick. And here's the reason why they gravitate this way. In time, that changed when we got into the 80s, where they said it's no longer a disease, however, it's just simply, and you remember the statement if you lived during that time, an alternate lifestyle. Once we crested 2000 and forward, that no longer became a sickness or an alternate lifestyle. Now it became a right. Pride causes people to make excuses and causes people to defend their sin. Pride now causes us to force others to accept their sins and accept their sin as a part of themselves and who they are. So where are we at in a society today? Notice the name, the word that is chosen for their movement. What's the name, please? Pride. Interesting, isn't it? Satan knows what to call it. 1 Corinthians 5 says this, It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you. The word fornication does not simply mean uh, sexual activity uh, between young people, but rather the word fornication means anything that is outside the boundaries of what God has ordained. It is reported commonly, Paul said, that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles. And what Paul was saying is, the things that you're allowing at church aren't even what lost people would agree to. That one should have his father's wife. And trust me, folks, incest is right on the, we're right on the, the crest of it. And ye are puffed up, that's pride, and have not rather mourned that he that hath done this deed might be taken away from you. They were proud. 
to have this individual in their midst. They said, you know what? We like this guy. In fact, we're glad he's a part of our group. An excellent example of somebody that accepted responsibility as opposed to making excuses was David, of course, in Psalm 56. David said this when he was penitent over his uh, escapades and his indiscretions he said to the Lord against thee and the against thee and thee only have I sinned David was accepting where the church at Corinth made excuses rejection of accountability what's another manifestation of pride the first one we spoke of what is it would you say it loud that's correct Rejection of authority, rejection uh, of accountability, that rebellion, the rejection of accountability. Then notice also what pride will do to us. Pride causes us to respond with an argument. Respond with an argument. Raise your hand if you've ever had to deal with somebody who has an argumentative spirit. Raise your hand if you've ever had to deal with somebody that has an argumentative spirit. It is so tough. It is so tough. If you say black, they say white. If you say red, they say blue. You can sometimes, with somebody who has an argumentative spirit, you can say the same thing they said the day before, and they'll say, that's not true. <laughs> and you think, okay, I'm not going to win. Responding with an argument, Proverbs 13.10. If you're in the book of Proverbs still, would you take a peek there? Proverbs 13.10, where the Bible says something very interesting about how we talk with other individuals. Proverbs 13.10, nice and loud, we'll read it together. Only by pride cometh contention, but with the well-advised is wisdom. In 1 Corinthians 6, Paul said this, if any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, that word wholesome means sane or words that are uh, healing, and consent not to wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness, he is proud, knowing nothing, but doubting about questions and strifes of words, whereof cometh envy, strife, railings, evil surmisings, perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. From such withdraw thyself. There are some individuals who have a contentious spirit. You just have to step back. You're not going to win the argument. And you know what's terrible? You never... You never jump into the deep end of the pool with somebody who has an argumentative spirit because they will beat you at their game. They're so good at it. And they will drown you in the process because they'll suck you into that pride-filled spirit. There was a man in uh, the, book of, uh, the third book of John. His name was Diotrephes. Diotrephes had a pride problem. I wrote unto the church, But Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. Wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds which he doeth, pratting against us with malicious words, and not content therewith, neither doth he himself receive the brethren, and forbiddeth them that would, and casteth them out of the church. And it seems so difficult that you would be a church that would not receive people. When I first uh, came here as pastor... I, of course, did not know everybody. I knew very few people, and uh, there was uh, somebody on staff that was helping me. I had asked him to stay on for a year to help me uh, get to know everybody. But there was somebody here at church, and uh, he said several times, Pastor so-and-so came to church, and uh, they had not been uh, in a while, but they came, and I didn't let them come in. I helped you. And I told them, you will not. We don't have bouncers at the door here at church. You will not stop somebody from coming into church. That's a contentious spirit. Now, if the church congregation and the deacons decide that somebody uh, should not be at church, uh, then uh, we'll, we'll go with that if somebody's coming in to harm. But to have somebody not come into church because you personally don't like them, they stole your recipe or something, who knows? 
Responding with arguments is a manifestation of pride. Let's keep going. Resistance from the Almighty. Resistance from the Almighty. Now I want you to listen close. And I want you to pay attention because this is one of the very dangerous things about pride. I know we don't like to think about this. But without a doubt, the very worst thing that can happen to me, very worst thing that can happen to you when you have a spirit of pride is that God himself would stand against you. The Bible says it very clearly that God will not tolerate pride. Proverbs 6 says this, These six things doth the Lord hate, yea, seven are abomination unto him. What's the first on the list? Proud look. It's right at the top. Not just that God doesn't like it, but an abomination is a level that God just really cannot tolerate. So here's a couple of references to help us to understand how God moves against somebody who's moved in pride. I'm going to read them quick. You can ask me later. I could give you the references, but I want to read them and get you on the road because the roads are not getting any better. James 4, 6. Thank you so much for being here tonight. God bless you. It takes a lot of effort and a lot of faith for you to get on the roads when the roads are like this. And I told Brother Lefebvre, I said, I know you didn't come tonight to hear the preaching because there's not enough love uh, in his heart uh, toward me to hazard himself on roads like that. But it's his love toward the Lord, and I appreciate it, and I don't take it lightly. James 4, 6 says, But he giveth more grace. Wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Now let's understand what God is saying here. It's not that God is neutral towards you. It means that now God is working against you as if you were his enemy. And that's a dangerous place to be. Ladies and gentlemen, when I pray and I have needs or some emergency comes up and somebody says, hey, will you pray about this and such? I need prayer right now. I really want to be able to, to get through to heaven. And I'm not saying that we keep our spirit humble because we may need something from God. I'm not saying that we're going to be self-seeking in that way. But what I am saying is sometimes folks are in that position where God cannot hear their prayer because they have a spirit of pride that's eating them up. God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. 1 Peter 5.5 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another, and be clothed with humility, for God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. God's grace available to us if our spirit is in check. 2 Samuel 22.28 And the afflicted people thou wilt say, but thine eyes are upon the haughty, that thou mayest bring them down. What is God's intention for a pride-filled person? God's design for that individual is he will bring them down. That's why I know that some of the leadership that we have right now will not last. Why? Because God's going to bring them down. I don't have to, we don't have to pray that somebody will take them out. Away with that kind of talk. Something more severe. They will have to deal with the hand of God. That's serious. Psalm 12.3 The Lord shall cut off all flattering lips, and the tongue that speaketh proud things. Psalm 138.12 Thou, Lord, be high, yet hath he respect unto the lowly, but the proud he knoweth afar off. Some of these individuals, they think they're snowing somebody over on this stuff. Friend, you can snow a lot of people over, but you aren't going to snow him over. Proverbs 
6, 16, we mentioned already, 15, 23, the Lord will destroy the house of the proud, but he will establish the border of the widow. Proverbs 16, 5, everyone that is proud in the heart is an abomination to the Lord. Though hand join in hand, he shall not be unpunished. The last one is this, there will be a ruin from arrogance. Our text is clear. Pride brings destruction. If we were writing an equation, we would write it like this. Pride equals destruction. And that's a perfectly balanced equation. Because destruction is synonymous with pride. We could make that equation also. Pride equals shame. That's a balanced equation. Mathematically, pride equals reproach. Why does the proud person promote himself? Why does the proud person lie and lift himself up so that he can look better? And the design of pride is just the opposite of what the person thinks will happen. It will bring nothing but shame and reproach. In our text, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. A Proverbs 11.2, when pride cometh, then cometh shame, but with the lowly is wisdom. Proverbs 18.12, before destruction of the heart, man is haughty, and before honor is humility. Proverbs 29.23, a man's pride shall bring him low, but honor shall uphold the proud in spirit. What is the conclusion of this matter of pride? Peter said it beautifully when he said this, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. You can either humble yourself, or God will do it. It's your choice. It's your choice. You can do it, or God will do it. The Bible says that the grace of God is so wonderful that God can humble a man without humiliating him. The grace of God is so wonderful that God can lift a man up. He can exalt him without puffing him up. That's how wonderful our God is. Just a little reminder tonight that we all need, I need this. We all need to be reminded about this grievous sin of pride.